Welcome to the Change Within Podcast. This is Gerard Uselli here. We are on episode eight. It has been such a wonderful sense of community for everyone that we've reached out to all throughout New York, all throughout the country, and the sense of collaboration is just exciting to say the least. So from our last couple episodes, we've had some stops and, and detours in Staten Island alongside going to the Bronx with my last guest. And now we're back on Staten Island with a very good friend of mine, fundraising colleague and performer, Jessica Caracciolo. Jessica, how are you? Hi, good. How are you, Jerry? Good to see you. Absolutely. Always good here. You know, we're quarantined on Staten Island together. So how, how much better could it get in quotations, right? Can't. It can't. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, now that's the first great answer we could definitely resort to on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so as we're on the topic of Staten Island, and as somebody who's a native here myself, what was your childhood like growing up? Um, the only word that comes to mind is awesome. I grew up as an only child, well, still uh, growing up as an only child, um, very close to my parents, and yeah, born and raised here on Staten Island, and uh, you know, my little tripod family. My childhood was wonderful, very, very supportive environment. I'll say this, when it comes to how families are around here, whether it's how a child pursues his or her interest as far as sports, acting, the whole nine yards, I've come to notice the support system is definitely overwhelming in a positive way. Like just even with things that I wasn't good at, like my, a lot of my sports interests and hobbies, I've had a lot of unprecedented support and kind of like cheerleaders to like help move people forward. And although you get like a lot of crazy stigmas like around here, that's one of the positives I will say that's kind of uniform. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree. I mean, I can't um, even remember a time or any endeavor that I took on that my parents or someone wasn't there to support me, um, you know, whether it was tennis or horseback riding or soccer. And then, of course, when I came into my own and got into theater and dance and um, you know, even through college, my, my parents were always there. You know, my mom calls herself the seal. She's just always clapping for yeah, me. So. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. So kind of to that regard, like how, how did your journey in performing come about? And when you were starting out, like how was your stage fright? Were you able to handle pressure in like your own way? Yeah, I think um, I started I guess performing at the age of three, I was in dancing school. I went to Brandy's right on Highland Boulevard and it was always something I wanted to be a part of. So I never felt the pressure. So I feel like stage fright was never really a, a thing for me, which I'm really thankful for because, um, you know, it, it never held me back. And from three until until now, I feel like I probably get more nervous now than I did when I was three. The stakes are a little higher. People are a little more judgmental when you're, when you're a bit older. But um, I had such a great foundation, like you said, with, with the support that I, I was never nervous getting on a stage because I always thought about it as, um, you know, growing up, I was part of the Staten Island Children's Theater as well. And we started off every performance with like a prayer or a mantra or whatever you want to call it. And it was with a song on my lips and a prayer in my heart please help me to make at least one person happy. And I knew that every time I stepped out onto the stage, I didn't need to be nervous because all I was doing was just putting a smile on somebody's face. And it's something to that regard too, especially like as kids are doing acting, like when you were kind of going through the motions of that, was there kind of like scenarios where like the teamwork wasn't as prevalent or was it kind of like you're all in this together, even like when you were younger? Did you feel like that avid sense of competition among people? I think there was always camaraderie. Um, I was so close to all the girls that I danced with and, um, you know, the people that I did theater with at Staten Island Children's Theater are my best friends in the whole world. So I never felt a sense of competition. I think because we were all there, it was, we were there for fun. It was never, you know, a, a career. No one was making money um, or paying money to do it, you know? <laughs> um, and even when I was able to do it professionally, um, I never felt a competition just because, like I said, everyone's there because they love performing. Um, and, your ch chance or your shot or whatever it is, is going to come at some point. So no, no reason to have competition. Just 
love, love everyone. <laughs> Transitioning to the, my next question, what was kind of like your most surreal experience within your performing arts background? Was there ever a time you were just completely starstruck by the opportunities you were given? And it was just like, wow, I can't believe I did this. Yeah, I think um, surreal experience kind of like lasted for, I would say about two years um, when I left corporate America and decided to pursue performing professionally. I couldn't believe I actually did it. Um, I left a really good, stable career, a stable salary, um, and I just kind of picked up and I said, I wanna do something that's really gonna make me smile and make p other people smile. Um, so that was just make, doing that, making that decision was super surreal. And then I'll never forget, you know, the first job that I got offered. Um, I was in Springboro, Ohio at a dinner theater to do Annie. And, um, you know, some people might look at it as like big deal, but I was like, oh my God, I'm getting paid to sing and dance. Like, how is this even possible? And then from, you know, there I got a few other jobs and got to travel around the country a bit. And I'll never forget the one um, audition that I went on, it was for a theater in Clarksville, Tennessee, which is right near Nashville. And um, the director, I love him. I wound up booking the job, but he said at the audition, he said, treat every job like it's your Broadway. And that really resonated with me because um, I couldn't believe what I was doing. And to me, everything felt like Broadway because I was just doing the thing, you know, I was making a paycheck. It was a small paycheck, but I was making something and I was able to, you know, wake up every day and know that I was doing something that I loved. With that being said, for something like Annie, was that one of your favorite Broadways or kind of like within the theater background you've always liked growing up? Because I know you were in Mamma Mia too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've done you know, 20 plus, I don't even know how many musicals I've, I've been in. Um, but Annie was actually the first like real soundtrack that I got into. I used to clean the house, you know, pretending uh, I was, you know, I was in the movie or whatever, you know, with Carol Burnett. I think it came out in the eighties, um, Bernadette Peters. Yeah. But Annie was definitely a big one for me. And then I think my first Broadway show was Beauty and the Beast. So that one will always, you know, stay close to my heart. Absolutely. And kind of to fast forward in that regard, before taking your position at On Your Mark, how were you involved with them in the past and what led to that change? Yeah, On Your Mark was an organization that um, me and my family had always been involved in and supported, whether, you know, that was attending their annual galas. I actually wound up, um, I was working as a DSP, a direct support professional, um, for a couple summers in college at their Decay House. Um, and then, you know, I I got a little older. I started working in corporate America. I didn't. I didn't really have too many ties to it. And then I. Um, I heard that there was a need for Santa's helper, like an elf, to go around um, to the houses to help give out candy canes. So the past like three or four years, I was doing that, and it was always just a population I was super drawn to. Um, adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's just. Um, it's a feeling like no other, you know, when, when you're involved with them. Um, and so I kind of always saw myself being involved in some capacity, whether it was volunteering. Um, I honestly never pictured working here, but um, in October, I went up to Camp Chilloway, which is actually one of On Your Mark's newest um, real estate endeavors. And it actually serves as like a getaway for some of the individuals and for anyone to use. Um, it, it serves as a fundraiser. And so I was up there for a murder mystery weekend um, for Halloween. And um, John Bellotti, the executive director, had approached me and said, listen, we have this opening. We think you'll be great at it. And I was like, John, I don't want to work at a nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I can't. I, got, I just coming off of two years being an actor. I have no money. I don't know what I'm going to do. But I don't think that this is going to be the right thing for me. And then you know, I, I took the interviews and I went into the interview saying, I don't, John, thank you so much. I appreciate it, you know, but, and it was like my second or third interview. I'm sitting there and I actually started like crying <laughs> within the interview. It was like five people in the room wow. and I got all choked up talking about how passionate I was about the organization. And I left and I said, oh my God, if I get this job, I have to take it because, um, you know, and you just know you're at the right place at the right time. And it just, it feels right. That, that was this job for me. So um, whatever convoluted way I, I ended up here, I'm so glad to be a part of the team now. 
I think to that point too, and something that's very special about On Your Mark is you were talking about working in corporate America for a little bit before leaving. Don't you kind of feel like with On Your Mark's programming, especially like the small businesses, the chocolate shop that just opened, I feel like that sense of entrepreneurship and for those individuals with disabilities to come into their own, there's, they're kind of like establishing a prevalence that, hey, we're here to do something. We're here to make a difference with impact. Exactly. And, you know, the goal, the mission of On Your Mark is to, you know, provide services that really help these individuals become as independent in society as they can. So giving them, you know, supported employment opportunities, whether that's in the businesses that we um, operate on our own or going out into the community and getting a job at, you know, Home Depot or, or ShopRite or something like that. Um, it really does foster a sense of not only independence, but purpose. Um, you know, it gives them the opportunity to feel proud about something, to produce something every day. So, I mean, there's a million things that this organization does to truly empower um, everybody that, that comes uh, along. Absolutely. And also with the sense of doing your fundraising presentations currently, did you ever take like kind of some aspects of what you've done in your theater background and incorporate it within like your fundraising, whether it was kind of like in a more structured like environment or something where you could have work with some creativity? Have those two worlds collided before? Yeah, I mean, I attribute every success in my life to theater. Anything that I've done, there's been some experience that I've, I've been able to draw from, um, you know, whether that's public speaking or just, you know, confidence is key. That's what theater teaches you, right? You have to go on stage and be convincing that you're, that you're somebody else. I also think that theater gives you an incredible amount of empathy. You know, you're forced to, to draw from experiences and you're, you're forced to, if you're portraying a character, you know, you have to feel what that character is feeling. You have to put yourself in their shoes. So I'm able to go through life every day kind of with that hat on and say, you know, these are the individuals that I'm serving. Like, I'm not raising money. I'm not fundraising for myself. I'm fundraising for them and for the greater good of this organization. So to be able to do all of that stuff with the feeling of empathy, I think is so, so important. And I think that, you know, being an actor, being a part of the, you know, performing arts community allows you to be a bit more open to those feelings than maybe somebody um, who doesn't. So there's such a crossover. Absolutely. And like, fake it till you make it, right? That's, <laughs> that's, that's what I live by, honestly, every single day. And um, if I could be convincing at something, then hey, <laughs> I say I did it. I did it well for the day. <laughs> Well, that kind of convolutes into how we first met each other when we were working for Sunrise Day Camp. And one of my ideas that I brought to the table was Sing Till Sunrise. So it was a karaoke event. And one thing part of your acting, which I could tell you were definitely acting, but a great sport about, was your love for karaoke. <laughs> Yeah, definitely didn't have to pretend about that one. But if I can sing and make money at the same time for an amazing cause, I mean, check, check, check. That's three great things happening right there. So no convincing Absolutely. me there. Like there was one event I remember we were doing together and you had, like I kind of did it in a fundraising like team. So I had four different teams represent and you were one of them. And I don't know if you remember this, you were like bringing around your fundraising box and like I, I could just tell like people were just so immersed in doing something for the greater good. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm curious, have, are you like still in touch with Sunrise at all? Have you like kind of spoken to people who still work there and stuff like that? Yeah, of course. I'm, I'm super, I'm, you know, I'm actually chairing um, an event that's happening next week. There's a virtual comedy show that's, um, that's going on. And, um, you know, working here at On Your Mark, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be able to um, be, keep that relationship. And On Your Mark does such a wonderful job at supporting all of the organizations on Staten Island, um, you know, that they're going to advertise it on their billboard in front of the ICC on Victory Boulevard. So, you know, I fully intend to, um, to stay involved, as involved with Sunrise as I can, because that's an organization that I really, you know, we both started fundraising for really from the ground up. Um, and it's, it's made such strides over the past five years on Staten Island. So yes, I definitely am very much still involved with them. That's amazing. And with all, the, with all the great philanthropic work that you've been doing, I'm curious to know this kind of in a general sense, like what does kindness mean to you? 
It's a tough question, Jerry. <laughs> um, I think it's the innate act of goodness. <laughs> Is that just like using synonyms to describe it? Probably. Um, I think that there's multiple ways in which you can show kindness. Um, showing kindness towards others, I think to me means, um, you know, doing a, a selfless act for them, um, to putting their needs before your own, um, you know, taking the time, like I said before, to come from a place of empathy and, you know, truly trying to understand and, and take a walk in, in that person's shoes. But I also think, and, you know, especially now more than ever, it's super important to show kindness to yourself. Um, you know, we take on a lot as, as humans and as good humans, right? There's, uh, you know, me, you, anyone who's involved in, in this sort of world, the nonprofit world is constantly giving to others. And that could be very taxing on a human, you know? Um, so I think being able to take a step back and, you know, not overextend yourself and, and make sure that you're being kind to, to who you are, um, I think is also super important. So I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> it definitely answers we got a couple that, things as far somewhere. as my question, that's for sure. And, uh, and kind of to touch back on your, on the point of your parents, they're an exemplary support system from what, from the few times that I've met them. What was the biggest way you're inspired by them as far as how you carry yourself forward? My parents are just, I have no words. I mean, I hit the jackpot when it comes to, comes to mom and dad. Um, you know, they have shown me what it means to be truly selfless. Um, I think in their parenting for me, they've, they've raised me with only my best interests in mind. And I, I can't even imagine ways that I, I can rip, repay for them. I promise I won't put you in an old age home. I'll take care of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but I mean, inspiration isn't even a word to describe how influential they've been um, on my life. So, you know, they're selfless and they're just extremely generous, you know, not just with me, not just with our family, but with everybody who they meet, you know, they, they've been saving up bread to, you know, go feed the birds down at South Beach, you know, like they're, they, they, anything that they can do to help someone or something, um, is it's just that's what that's what keeps me going every day and i think i do everything to make them proud and i i hope i hope i've achieved that or am continuing to achieve that with them with with all that being said as my final question you definitely have a lot to offer as a platform just as who you are as a person and everything that you're doing what's the biggest change that you want to see in 2021 from what we already went through in last year um, well, thank you for that compliment. Um, the biggest change I'd like to see is there was a lot of commitments to change last year. I think if we look at it, you know, from the top down, these huge corporations were making um, commitments to supporting employees, supporting the communities during COVID, during these racial justice movements. Um, you know, so much went down last year that was truly eye-opening. And a lot of people said, I'm going to change. And this year I wanna see that change happen. Um, I wanna see people actually step up to the plate and make the changes that they talked about making. Um, that's the change I would like to see. And then I think, you know, within myself, um, I would hold myself to that standard. You know, I said I was gonna do a lot of things. Um, I said I was gonna, you know, continue educating myself um, continue, you know, advocating for those who can't advocate for themselves. And I fully intend to commit to that, um, to the best of my ability. Great. So with that being said, that concludes our eighth episode for the Change of Fin podcast. For those who don't know, you can find us on Anchor, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Jessica, thank you so much for coming on for today and have a great night. Yeah, you too. Thanks so much, Jerry. Hope to see you in person soon when it's safe. <laughs> Absolutely. All the best. Take care.